Thank you, Mark. Uh, Mark's efforts has, have made it easier for NARA to be green, and <laughs> we're very grateful and also proud of the work that he's doing. For those of you who are just joining us, we've, uh, Mark has been our first lecture. We started about five minutes late, so, uh, but, but according to those lights, we're on schedule. We have three more speakers this afternoon. Each will talk for about 15 minutes, and then we're allowing some time for questions after. Uh, welcome, if you're just joining us. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who is Lisa Isbell. Lisa is a senior conservator in the Document Conservation Laboratory at NARA. She had an early background in art with an AB in studio art and a master's degree in art history. In the early 80s, she taught art history at Florida State University, where she also supervised the visual resources collection. She received her introduction to conservation at the Florida State Archives and later received an MA in Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works from Buffalo State College. Lisa trained with paper conservators at several institutions, and prior to coming to NARA, uh, she was a conservator at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum, which I have to ask her more questions about that. <laughs> Sounds like fun. Um, Lisa is going to talk about Up From the Deep, Treating Records Salvaged from a World War II Shipwreck. In December 2007, Ira Kirschenbaum, an archivist in the National Declassification Center, forwarded an email to me concerning, quote, records from the USS Perry that was sunk off Australia in 1942. The records are very badly damaged and deteriorated and placed in burlap bags housed in FRC boxes, end quote. By way of providing a historical context, um, the USS Perry, a Clemson-class destroyer, was commissioned on October 22, 1920, and named after the famed polar explorer Robert E. Perry. Within two years, the Navy assigned the destroyer to the United States Asiatic Fleet, based near Manila in the Philippines. For the first 20 years, the destroyer's career was routine. The December 7, 1941 attack on Pearl Harbor found the Perry, quote-unquote, cold iron, meaning that her boilers were not operating, undergoing what was termed a Navy Yard overhaul. Three days later, while she was still immo immobile, Japanese bombers attacked the military and naval facilities around Manila, which resulted in a quarter of the Perry's crew being dead, wounded, or missing. After dodging Japanese air raids in the Manila area for more than two weeks, the Perry was ordered to join naval forces in Port Darwin, Australia. The Perry made her way down the Philippine archipelago, suffering attacks not only from the Japanese, but also friendly fire from the Australians. After struggling with an engineering problem, the destroyer arrived in Port Darwin in northern Australia on January 3, 1942. <clears throat> the Perry then acted as an anti-submarine escort for convoys taking supplies and troops to the Netherlands East Indies. On February 19, 1942, Port Darwin was struck by a surprise attack by over 200 Japanese aircraft. All of the ships caught in the harbor were sunk. The Perry went down in 90 feet of water. More than 80 crew and officers died. Witnesses noted that even as the Perry sank, two machine guns continued to fire at the assailing aircraft. The war was fought, peace attained. In 1959, after 17 years had passed from the sinking of the Perry, Australian authorities contracted a Japanese scrap firm to salvage the wreck on the floor of Darwin Harbor. In the course of the salvage efforts, the Japanese workers opened the Perry's registration, excuse me, registered publication safe and delivered the contents either to the Australian government or the U.S. Embassy. Either way, the soggy mess ended up in the hands of the U.S. Embassy in Canberra. Classified material transfer form dated January 4, 1961, indicates that a courier accompanied the classified records to Washington, D.C. I'm indebted to supervisory archivist A.J. Dabry for providing me with this historical context for these records. And I commend to you an article that he's written that's coming out shortly in the, in the National Archives Prologue magazine. And then 46 years passed before Ira Kirschenbaum in the National Declassification Center emailed me with this pessimistically message ending, do you think it would be worth a look? 
three FRC boxes arrived. This is a uh, NARA term for uh, the Federal Record Center boxes, these boxes in which uh, records are often housed in our record centers and they're often transferred to us in this form. So this is the way they looked when they arrived into the lab. At the time I noted, quote unquote, many of the pages are blocked and encased in mud. The Conservation and Declassification Center staff both agreed that the primary purpose of the conservation treatment was not to make the materials safe to serve, which is uh, commonly a goal in the conservation lab, but rather merely to get the materials to a point that the archivists could uh, describe and, and uh, access the records and, and uh, make them available on the catalog. The archivists could then make a preliminary arrangement and description of the records. I, I emphasize this because um, I just want to say that this there weren't like dramatic before and after images. It, <laughs> it, it doesn't get much better. <laughs> the conservation treatment largely involved the mechanical reduction of the dried mud, dirt, and rust, and separating materials stuck together. Uh, I was talking with my supervisor yesterday, and I said, they don't teach you this in the conservation training programs. <laughs> Jokingly, I told my colleagues that I was involved in archaeological paper conservation. Uh, since many but not all of the encrusted materials were, are books, uh, my cons and my conservation is more in the area of flat paper, I frequently conferred uh, with senior book conservator Gail Harriman. Early on, I commented to Gail that I knew that after the 1966 Florence flood, conservators washed entire books with neither disbinding them nor separating them into gatherings. So I asked her if that was an option, and she agreed that in light of, um, this is to give you, I, I felt like they were like pieces of shale. I mean, they were just rock hard. Um, she, Gail agreed that in light of the history of the materials, that is, they're having been submerged for seven, all these years, and their present condition, it was acceptable to approach them by immersing them. Um, and I show this. This is an example of before and after. This is the same book. Uh, and I also show this by way of, of demonstrating that uh, they, they're not glamorous after treatment images. <laughs> Uh, this is the, that same volume uh, as it was in the course of treatment. This is immersed in uh, deionized water. And for those not familiar with conservation, underneath is a piece of um, non-woven polyester that you use sort of as a sling to lift it out of, out of the water. A lot of these materials were not uh, brittle so much as they were pulpy. It was like uh, inexpensive paper napkins that had been gotten wet and mushed and encased in mud. That was the type of thing I was trying to deal with. Um, conservators are primarily concerned with materials and condition, and often, uh, at least at the professional level, leaving uh, intellectual conundrums and interpretations to archivists and researchers. However, I must admit that as these materials were separated and uncovered, I couldn't help but being drawn into the subject matter. Uh, this one I found quite charming. Let's see if I can do this. If you look up here, it says most secret, the most secret. Um, I thought, oh, isn't that quaint? And archivist Daverid advised me that that's actually the British term for <laughs> what we would say top secret. Um, the, the Perry contained uh, American records as well as British and Dutch records. Uh, here you see an example of the types of things that were uh, found in this safe. Uh, these are code books. Uh, Archivist Daverid advised me that the military changed codes frequently, and the uh, cryptographers were under orders that every time they received a new code, new codes, they were supposed to destroy all of the old ones. But what happened is at the Perry, they were very lax about this. So the result was that the, the safe ended up being a small library of cryptographic materials immediately preceding World War II. Um, here's another example of the code books. Uh, and this image also allows me to state that in, in beginning this treatment, in considering the, the background of these materials, they're having been submerged and then uh, stored in their burlap bags and, and 
the embassy for a while, I was expecting that there would be a lot of mold. In fact, there was very little mold. And if you look, what looks to be like soot, and it is, you'll see these sorts of grayish areas, that's the mold. And it, 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 there really wasn't very much at all, which, which very much surprised me. Um, conservators at the National Archives, and really the conservators here in Washington, D.C., we have the luxury of having access to a number of colleagues for consultation for difficult problems, and I, I felt quite justified in approaching my uh, colleagues and, and to, to ask questions. Um, in May 2008, Kathleen Baker visited our lab. She's a senior cons uh, conservator of book and paper at the Preservation and Conservation at the University of Michigan Library in Ann Arbor. Uh, I had studied, I, uh, Kathy had been my advisor in graduate school, so I felt comfortable approaching her. And so I asked her uh, if she had any advice. And she came to my bench and saw this, and she said one word. She said, ethanol. And I was like, okay. And she pointed out that uh, ethanol is an alcohol. It's one of the many solvents that conservators use. And when paper is immersed in a solvent, it takes on properties different from what it has, either in the air or in water. And it uh, subjectively, it seems to stiffen and harden. So Kathy thought if we submerged this, if some of these in ethanol, it might be possible to peel them off. So we thought that that was worth a try. Um, and this is a bit of an assembly line production. Uh, this was before I conferred with Kathy. These are immersed, these volumes are immersed in deionized water. Um, and uh, specifically, I want to point out the one that's up here sort of in the top center. Uh, this was one of the more pro problematic ones. These others responded to water treatment, but that one and the, the smaller one up there did not. It was just very pulpy, and it just kept sticking together. So I thought, this is a good candidate for the, for the ethanol treatment. Uh, and here you can see it was working in a fume hood, and I immersed this in a, a small tray of ethanol, uh, and I worked with, with it on and off in the course of a day. And it really behaved very much as it did in water, and at the end of the day, I was just, I just gave up, and I said, okay, I've tried my best, and I, I took it out of the ethanol, and I left it in the fume hood to dry out overnight, thinking, that, that's it, I can't do any more, I've done what I can. Um, and the next morning, I came in, and it was still there, and I went over with some of the, the tools that we have in conservation of microspatula, and I started picking at it and the first page popped off. And I got all excited, and I kept going and going and going. And I got that book apart, to my, to my great surprise. So you can see that while the treatment didn't work the way the conservators expected it to, it did work. So we were very happy. And I was able, this is a, a method that we use for flattening. We'll humidify and then place uh, uh, paper between blotters, and then you can see pieces of plexiglass there. We put that on top with weights if we can flatten them. So I was able to humi humidify and flatten these. Uh, and then what I did, I was able, I was uh, relatively confident that I was able to figure out what pieces went with what sheet, so I was able to retain the sheets together. And then I inserted them in these polyester sleeves. Now, what you see here with my little warning label, this is not what we would call safe to serve because we don't like putting more than one piece of paper in a single polyester sleeve because there's too much danger of the edges rubbing against each other and causing more damage. However, I felt this was a method of keeping each sheet with its companions, companion parts of its sheet. Uh, and here you see uh, the records as they were returned back to uh, declassification. You can see they expanded from uh, three boxes to five, in fact, which is, is very common with, with uh, uh, treatments such as this. In fact, if you have a very thoroughgoing treatment and go further and uh, clean, 
humidify, flatten, you could probably compress them back again to, to the same amount of space. But there's always this weighing of, of time versus space, and so it's, it's a, a struggling with priorities. So are there any questions? Are you relieved you didn't have to? <laughs> I joke that um, I joke that so many of these materials are books that the the next person to to handle these should should be a book conservator. Oh. My question is oh. about the paper. Is it primarily wove paper, or was it a mix of laid and wove papers? Um, this would have been pre-World War II. I think a, a lot of it was machine-made, yeah, wove. Um, I, I don't, I didn't do meticulous documentation. It was really, as I said, it was archeological excavation. <laughs> but, yeah. It was very pulpy. How many months did you work? How many months did you work on this? Do you remember? I, it was like about a year and a half. I mean, I didn't work solidly. It was it was on and off as 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 time allowed. It was it was always in the background, and it was always I always felt as if there was a, a haze of harbor silt over my <laughs> workspace. And I I don't know if you noticed I had it sort of removed from my my regular bench space because it was just I just didn't want all that too near. <laughs> Did you have problems with salt, or did the deionized water take care of that and remove the salts? Um, I, I didn't notice problems with the salt salts per se. Um, I mean, it's not it's not anything I sought to quantify or even test. Um, I wasn't aware of any uh, conservation problems related specifically to salt. I mean, it was more water and mud and rust and. <laughs> Thank you.